Welcome to this wealth creation series as we explore principles for abundant life. This series forms part of our Christian growth track, which equips you to find and fulfill your life purpose. To get the most out of this session, find a quiet space or use earphones. Kindly register to receive the links for the remainder of this free series by contacting info at cohcc.net or 079-520-2088. Also order your copy of the Power to Create Wealth book and join an on-site or online small group discussion after each session. Help us spread this message via sharing it on Facebook or by making a financial donation. Well, it's been amazing to, to, to just do this journey in wealth creation and follow Israel's journey. And, and we're moving now to the New Testament, which is really where the good news sets in. And, and Jesus comes and he has one message. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he introduces the kingdom of God. And um, what we're going to learn in this session is seven principles of kingdom wealth. And it's interesting that, that Jesus comes and as he introduces uh, the kingdom of God, he doesn't override or undermine all the wealth principles that we've learned in the Old Testament up to now. In fact, Jesus actually reinforces all of these principles. But in the context of what we've learned up to now, the foundation that we've learned up to now, he comes and he introduces seven principles that we find in the Gospels of managing and stewarding and building kingdom wealth. And so that's that's very exciting. And, and um, we pick the first one up in Matthew 6, verse 19, where it says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures. Can you say the word treasure? Okay. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Say, say with me, say... It's the principle of the treasure. Okay? Jesus comes in, comes in and introduces the, the principle of the treasure. Now, human kingdoms go for land and they go for silver and they go for gold and they go for riches. But what does the kingdom of God go for? People. Human hearts. That's the territory of God's kingdom. The Bible says, Jesus himself says, as he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And when you want to locate somebody's heart, the easiest way to see where somebody's heart is, is to try and locate his treasure. That's why when you touch somebody's wallet, you know exactly where his treasure is. That's why there's so many scriptures in the Bible on money and on wealth and on riches. Why? Because God is really, really interested in how we deal with money. Why? Because it reveals our hearts. It reveals where our heart is. To align to heaven's kingdom, we must make heaven's treasure our treasure. What is heaven's treasure? People. It's the only currency that we can take into the eternal life. Think about this. You know, I told this story about this rich man who took his bag of gold when he passed away. He packed his bag of gold full of gold bars and he he arrived at the pearly gates and was met by St. Peter. We said to him, my friend, what did you bring for us? And he said, no, I brought some gold bars. And as they opened it and Peter looked at it, he said, oh, you brought some paving stones. You see, our greatest treasures on earth is worthless in heaven. It's like paving stones. But the only treasure we can take from earth to heaven is people. And if we learn to invest in people, we align ourselves to heaven's treasure. When we use wealth and riches and money to love on people and show the goodness of God to people, we store up treasures in heaven. When we use our resources to evangelize people and save souls, we store up treasures in heaven. You know, we will either see money as an end in itself or we will see money as a means to an end. If I see money as an end, Guess what I will do? I will use people and I will use God even to gain that end, which is money. And, and that is really the love of money. The love of money is to use God and people to gain money and things. That's the love of money. Greed. 
But if money is not an end, but a means to an end, then I will use money and things to love on God and people and show the goodness and the love of God and manifest that towards people. And a, and a good exercise to do is to ask people who love you, who are close to you, who is around you, how they perceive you, whether you love money and things more than what you love them. for. Ask your spouse and ask your children. Ask them to be honest. How do they feel? Do you, do you treasure things, material things, more than them or the other way around? In Matthew 6, verse 22, we go to the next principle. We, not just the principle of, of the treasure, but the principle of the master. And Jesus himself says, As no one can serve two masters. Can you say masters? Okay. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve God and money simultaneously. And it brings us to the principle, the kingdom principle of the master. Heaven's kingdom is governed by this principle. And it states that you cannot submit to God and money at the same time. I learned this principle when I was invited by my mentor to go on a mission trip to Romania. Romania isn't when you stay here. It's not like you remain here. Romania is a country in the Eastern Bloc. And um, two weeks or a week before I had to pay my airfare, and when my mentor asked me, you know, where's your money? I said, I don't have any money. He said, you want to go? I said, I'll go if there's money. And he said to me, go and pray about it. When I prayed about it, God said, money is your master. Money is your God. That's why you can't go on this trip. I said, what do you mean, Lord? He said, you said by your own words, if money allows me to go on this mission trip, then I will go. So who made the decision? Money made the decision. You allow money to dictate what you will do. You say, I will do your will, God, only if money allows me to do your will. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? After apologizing, obviously. He said, change your attitude and say this. If God says I, will go on this, I must go on this mission trip, then I will go and money will have to fall in line. And I made that decision. I promise you, within two or three days, I had raised all the money for my airfare to go. You see, Jesus says this. He says, he says, if you submit to money, if money is your master, then Jesus cannot be your master. If money dictates what I can do and cannot do, then Jesus cannot dictate what I should do and shouldn't do. And so Jesus says it's important to understand in the kingdom of God that we submit to one master and that is Jesus Christ. And when we submit to him, when he becomes our only master, then we can exercise authority and subject money to serve us. Because this little thing called money was created by God, I believe, to be a servant and not a master. Money is a great servant but a lousy master. Money, why do we have money? Money was given so that it can serve the purposes of God in your life. So that it can finance your destiny or your assignment in life. But the problem is the more we and I submit to money and unfortunately debt, especially bad debt and unwise debt, makes us all the more slaves to this thing called money. And the more we are slaves to money, the less we can serve God. To the extent that you are free of money is the extent that you can really serve God. And so I remember I was still a student at Bible school back at that time. And the Lord gave me this exercise, and we're going to do it later at the end of the session, where I took my wallet every morning, and I threw my wallet on the ground, and I began to speak over money, and I declare that money is not my master, that money will not dictate, or dictate what I will do and what I can't do. And I had this whole ritual every morning where I spoke to money, and I declared, Jesus, I submit to you. And since that day, I lost my fear of money. I lost the fear of lack of money. Money has no emotional connection to me. There's no grip on my heart. If I have money, when I need money, whatever, I don't fear it. Why? Because I've got another master. I will not dictate it, be dictated by money what I can and cannot do because it's not my master. It's not my Lord. I belong to someone else. And he has helped me to master money and to learn continuously how to do that and to put money in its rightful place. So a good question to ask yourself when you fear, when you're anxious about money, is who is the master here and who is the servant? 
So remember, money or the love of money and the systems of the world is coming for you so that money can master us. Because it doesn't want us to be free to follow Jesus. What's the next principle of kingdom finances? Matthew 6, 25. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? It brings us to the principle of value, worth or value. That you have value. Jesus says, don't worry about what you'll eat, what you'll drink. God provides for the birds of the air. He will provide for you. <laughs> Are you not worth much more? Are you not much more valuable than the birds of the air? And that's the thing we worry about, isn't it? We worry about what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, where we're going to stay, where we're going to sleep. We worry about all these earthly things. And then Jesus continues in that passage and he says, Pagans worry about these things. Kingdom citizens don't worry about what they'll eat and drink and wear. But pagans do. Why do pagans worry? Because pagans do not know their value. Sons and daughters of the Father know they are valuable. And when I know I am valuable, I know my Father will provide for me. Do you know that my children, Jabin is 13 years old, although we've gone through some tough times financially, never in his life has Jabin ever worried about what he will eat or what he will wear or what he will drink. There hasn't been always Coke to drink, but there was always clean water to drink and there's always something to eat. You know, the Bible says, I've never seen the, the children of the righteous beg for bread. Some days the children of the righteous eat only bread, but they will always eat. You know, there are times in this process of creating wealth where, where our faith is tested, but there was always something to eat. Leonel is five years old. She has never worried about what she will eat, what to drink. Not because I'm so wealthy, not because I'm such a good father, but because they know their value that I will do whatever it takes to provide for them. Come on. Pagans worry, Jesus says. Pagans worry about what they will eat, what they will drink, and what they will wear. But if you're children of your father, you don't have to worry about that. He's taking care of that. If you know your value, the principle of value, are you not worth much more than the birds of the air? And if he clothes them in beauty, and if he feeds them morning by morning, will he not provide for you? You see, that's why you cannot separate my sense of identity and worth and value from creating wealth. It's so important that you and I realize how valuable we are. Look at this hundred rand note. Now, I've used this illustration before, but it remains true and powerful. Who imparted a hundred rands worth of buying power into this piece of paper. Because without that, it's only a piece of paper. The Reserve Bank of South Africa imparted a hundred rands worth of buying power into this piece of paper. It was an authority that imparted value or worth. Is that true? Now, who imparted value into us? Our Creator. As much as the Reserve Bank prints these money, God created us and he imparts value and he says you are worth much more than the birds of the air and therefore I will provide for you. See God imparts value to us. And we need to grasp this principle, the governing principle in God's kingdom of value. To do that, if you can go to the next slide, we need to understand that there's five different levels of value. The first one is eternal value. You and I have eternal value. We are the only eternal currency. Number two, we also have intrinsic value. We are created in the image and the likeness of God. We, we are the crown of creation, which means we have value in our Father's eyes. Number three, we have potential value. What is potential value? Potential value speaks into the potential as to what we can produce and multiply and achieve on earth. You know, if, if somebody can become a doctor, they're very clever, they can become a doctor or an engineer, that's the potential value. But how many of you know that that potential needs to be developed into capacity? Okay, that brings us to number four, the optimized value. 
I can have the potential to become a doctor, but never develop myself, drop out of varsity and all of that, and not optimize my value. Have you, have you, have you learned this, that if you optimize your value, a doctor earns more than a housekeeper, for instance. Why? Because the doctor has educated himself and skilled himself so that he can rent his time out for more money. That's how, like, like you increase the value of a property, you can increase your value as, as human capital by, by gaining new skills, by, by getting educated. And so that's optimized value. What we've done with our house was to optimize its value, to increase its value to, to, the, to the maximum and increase and optimize revenue and income. And then the last um, dimension of value is, is perceived value, is the value ascribed to other people, products, or assets. In other words, what people are willing to pay for it. Now, perceived value, interesting, fluctuates. Do you know that perceived value doesn't stay the same? If everybody wants to buy this blue jacket, I mean, all of you come to me afterwards and say, I really like your jacket, I want to buy your jacket. How many of you know that the price of the jacket suddenly goes up? Because suddenly now, because everybody wants it, it becomes fashionable, and suddenly now the price goes, so, so the perceived value is inflated. If nobody wants to buy the jacket, I probably will give it away for free. I need to pay you to take the jacket. You see, then the perceived value is deflated. And when the perceived value of individuals, of properties, of all these things, and services, services fluctuate, when it goes up and down, that's where you make money. You see, we're going through a recession right now, which means that properties will be sold again at a half price. You'll find many properties run about half price in the coming years. So the perceived value of properties and things are going to do that, which is great for us who want to invest in those things, because that's where you make money. When, when the intrinsic value, the real value of something, and the perceived value differs a lot, that's where you make money. In other words, if this is the intrinsic value of a, of a house, if, if a house, that house of us, the, the, the market value was 2.2, but the perceived value of everybody on that auction thought it's not worth more than 1.1, guess what? I bought a high value asset at low cost. What, what should we do when the market changes and suddenly somebody comes and he says, I will give you five million rand for that house. When he perceives that the house's value is much more than maybe what's, what his realistic value is, what do you do? You, you sell it. One of our farmer friends, he got so fed up with the, with the milli price fluctuating because in the beginning of the season when he plants, he sees the, 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 the corn price is high and so he plants millies and by the time he's finished pl- uh, reaping, everybody has, has, has planted millies and so the price has dropped. So he thought, no, he's not going to do that. He built silos on his farm. So when the millie price is, is, is up, he sells his millies. When the millie price is down, he keeps his millies and he buys more millies and he, and he puts a kettle on, 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 on crawl of food. And he feeds the millies and then he sells the cattle at a high price. You see, whether the market goes up and down, he's making profit. There's ways to do that. And that's good when there's that fluctuation between intrinsic value and perceived value. That's where you make money both ways. Actually make money always both ways. Uh, Back to property. How do we discern the intrinsic value of a property market? You know what gives you an indication of what the real value is of a property market is the rental income you can get on a property. When Katung and I were starting to look at properties in Kimberley, we realized that the purchase price, the, 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 to, to buy a property in some good areas in Kimberley is actually too expensive. We couldn't afford it. It was so expensive. But then I also learned that you can't rent the, that same property out for 1% of that bond. Which means that the selling price of the properties is higher than the rental price. So what's going to happen when the recession comes, it's going to equal, equalize. And you're going to find the price, the selling price of properties is going to come lower so that it matches the rental price. So I foresee in the next few years we'll get that. Will, the prices might not fall, but it will just, selling prices will just stagnate until the rental price has, has, has um, caught up. 
with the selling price. It's a good time to buy in a couple of years. So, so that's how you discern the, the intrinsic value, the real-time market value of property. Look at the rental price you can charge. That's why we didn't buy in Kimberley. <laughs> because I can rent much cheaper in Kimberley than, than what I would buy. But in the place where we bought, it's a different story. Okay. Why is it important that you and I discern our value, the principle of value? Money is made when you add value to a value chain. Now, what is a value chain? For me, with the house, the value chain was buying the property at half price, then renovating the property myself so I don't have to pay a contractor three, four times the price, then renting it out and managing it myself. And so I use professionals when needed, but, but I'm in, involved in this whole value chain. The other day I met a, a long distant cousin of mine who, who farms with cattle. And what they do is they buy collars, calves at, at 200 kilos, and then they put them on an on a, on a irrigation point and, and they um, round them off and they sell them three, four months later at 450 kilograms. So they add 250 kgs on a calf. They add value to it. But they, only don't, they don't just sell it to the abattoir. They somehow bought the abattoir and, and they sell it to themselves. And then they provide to the butcheries and they provide to Woolworths. You see, they're controlling the whole value chain because everybody in the chain wants their cut. So, so we make money, we make profit when we add value to a value chain. But here's the thing. If you and I don't know our value, we will actually fail to add true value to a value chain. And that's why identity and knowing our own sense of value is so important. Jesus says, the pagans worry about what you eat and drink and wear. But you know your value. Don't worry about that. You worry about adding value somewhere. Because you have value. The next kingdom financial or wealth principle is found in Luke 16 verse 11. So if you have not been faithful in handling worldly money, worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? The Greek word for faithfulness is being full of faith or God's persuasion. And the Greek word for, for unjust or wicked money, listen to this one, is a violation of God's valuation. It's amazing in the Greek language. A violation of God's value. In other words, God has a value, intrinsic value in everything. This property has intrinsic value. But why is money wicked? Because money will always violate God's valuation. We, we talk about Bill Gates and we say he's worth 85 billion US dollars. Do you know that that is not his worth? That is a violation of his valuation, of God's valuation over him. We refer to one another and say, you're earning so much a year, that's why you're worth 100,000 rand, or you're worth 500,000 rand, or that's your wealth portfolio. You, you are not worth your monetary value because money will always violate the value that God has placed in you. Matthew 6.33, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added. It brings us to the principle of priority. Seek Lost the king, or seek second the king, or seek first. Seek first. Make the king and his kingdom your first priority. I've learned this one thing, that the more I seek the things, the more I lose the king. And when I lose the king, I also lose the things. But when I seek the king first, the things follows me. It's just added to me. Why? Because the things are designed to follow the king. The good things will always follow the king. And if something seems good, but it's not following the king, then those things are not good for me. But if I seek the king, the things will follow. Jesus says, don't worry. And the word worry is also the word meditate. Don't worry. Don't be consumed. Don't be obsessed with the things of this world. Don't worry about what you will eat. Don't worry about the things. Worry about the king. Because if you follow the king, the things will come. What we worry about most reveals the kingdom we are seeking. Can I say that again? 
What we worry about most reveals the kingdom that we're seeking. Matthew 22 verse 18, Jesus perceived their malice. He's dealing with the Pharisees and the Herodians and, and, the, and the Sadducees. And he said, why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used to pay poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is in this? And they said to him, Caesar. So, so they gave him a coin. We've got a buffalo here, but remember, there's my Dibas face. So that was their Caesar. They saw Caesar's face on the coin. And, and then he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that, are, that is God's. It brings us to the fifth principle of kingdom wealth. And that's the principle of tax, tithing, and treating other people justly and fairly. You have two, you have two extreme sects that, that they come together and they want to trap Jesus. And so they come and they said, okay, the Pharisees... Are, 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 they were legalistic about tithing. You know, the Pharisees took even mint and, and even their, their herbs, and they would count out meticulously a tithe of all the grains of their herbs and give it to the Lord. They were so legalistic about tithing. But they didn't want to pay tax to Caesar because they were religious. They said, we'll pay to the Lord. We belong to Jehovah. We won't pay tax to Caesar. They were trying to evade their taxes. The other group that was there, the other sect was the Herodians, and they didn't even believe in God. The, the, the Sadducees didn't believe in God or heaven or hell. So they said, we'll pay tax to Caesar, but we won't pay ta- a tithe to God because we don't even believe in him. So these two groups conspired together against Jesus, and they say, listen, if Jesus say, pay tax to Caesar, then the Pharisees must take Jesus to the Jewish court and say he violated the principle of the tithe. You get that? If, if he says the other way, if he says, pay God is tithe, but don't pay tax, then the Herodians will drag him before King Herod and say, this man spoke against paying tax to Caesar. And Jesus masterfully says to them, pay unto Caesar what is his due, but pay unto God what is his due. What is Jesus saying? <laughs> Jesus is saying this. He says, when you pay your tax unto Caesar, unto civil authority, you, you are in right standing with civil authority. And when you pay your tithe unto God, you affirm that you are in right standing with heaven's authority. That's why he opens the floodgates of heaven. Heaven's authority, heaven's kingdom opens its floodgates when you honor God, when you give him his due. Let's continue reading another portion of scripture that speaks into this. Matthew 23, same, talks, talks to the teachers of the law. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, min, dal, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Jesus is saying, the weightier matters of the law is that you practice justice towards people. You see, I can't do business with David here and cheat him in business and say, but I'm all right because I pay my tithe. You see, that's injustice. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. In other words, Jesus is saying, still pay your tithe. Be faithful in your tithe. But that doesn't give you a clearance on how you treat people. And so this principle in kingdom finances is this. Taxes, tithing, and treating people justly. In the way we deal with money, we treat people fairly. Because that places us in right standing with people. In paying our taxes, it places us in right standing with civil authority. And in paying our tithes unto the Lord, places or affirms our right standing with His kingdom. And the floodgates of heaven will open over our lives. The sixth principle of the kingdom and kingdom wealth is that of stewardship. We're going to spend a little bit of time here. And we talked about that last night when we talked about governing. Remember, God's always expecting a return on investment. Remember the the parable of the talents. We talked about that. Parable of the talents. He gave one talent to a servant, two to another, and five talents to another. And one talent was equal to in today's term, to 15 years of salary. And 
two talents was worth 30 years of salary and five talents was worth 75 years of salary. So I'd like to think that after I've been in the, in the job market, after I've worked, I've been employed for 15 years, God comes to me and he says, as my master, he comes and he says, what have you done with the talent, the 15 years of pay that I've entrusted to you? How have you multiplied it? How have you increased it? How have you stewarded it? Is there anybody here that's been working for 15, run about 15 years, 14, 15, 16 years? Here we go. Here we go. And then at 30 years, he comes back and he says, what have you done with what I've given you? And then you've worked 75 years, he comes like, past the age of retirement. He goes like, what have you done with what I've given you? Because God always expects a return on investment. Stewards consider their income as seed resources received from God. We learned that last night. And if we multiply that, we can fulfill our life purpose with that. Stewardship determines how we will spend eternity. Remember the, the, the unprofitable servant, the, the one with the one talent, was cast into the outer darkness for all eternity. How we steward things on earth, how we steward money on earth, will determine how we will spend eternity. But stewardship unlocks greater authority in God's kingdom. Remember the servants who multiplied their two talents to four and the one who multiplies his five to ten. What did, what did Jesus say to him in, in the version in Luke? I think it's Luke 19, yes. Jesus said to him, because you were faithful over five talents, he says, now you will have authority over ten cities. That's what God wants for us as a church. That's what God wants for His children so that we can rule and reign with Him on earth. That He can give us governing authority over our cities, over our towns, over our nation. And maybe part of the reason why our country is in so, so much distress is not just the government, it's because we as the people of God fail to get this money thing right. We fail to steward money properly and so God can't entrust governing authority so that we can actually change things. There's a story, the most remarkable story, I think it's in Mark 10, where a rich young man comes to Jesus. You know that story? And he falls down in front of the feet of Jesus. And the Bible says he worships him. And he says, Master, what do I need to do to be perfect? And Jesus says to him, you know what to do. Keep the commandments. And he says, sir, but I've done the commandments. I've kept the commandments since the day of my youth. And then the Bible says Jesus looked at him and had compassion over him, and he loved him, he dearly loved him, and he said this, you lack one thing. Jesus said, what I want you to do is go and sell everything you have, and give the money to the poor, and you come and follow me. Jesus wasn't after his money, he was after his heart. The Bible says the young man grieved deeply, and in great sorrow he left, because he possessed much. The Greek word possessed either means to possess or, be to, or, or to be possessed. In other words, everything that I possess possesses me. Can I say that again? Everything I possess at the end of the day will possess me. Because when I think of that car as mine, then that car owns me. When I think of that house as mine, then that house owns me. Because everything that I think I possess is actually possessing me. And this young man could not part with what he possessed because everything he possessed, possessed him. And that was a real shocker to the disciples. In Mark 10 verse 28, because Jesus says that it's really difficult in that passage. He says it's really difficult for a rich man to go into the kingdom. Remember that story. And he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Remember that old story. Then for a rich man. And not a rich man, but it really means for a rich man who puts his trust in riches to enter the kingdom. And then Peter goes like, he says, but who then can be saved? And Jesus says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And then Peter speaks in verse 28 and he says, but Lord, we, <laughs> I love this guy. He said, Lord, we have left everything to follow you. Peter's starting to realize something. We've lost, we've left everything. We've abandoned everything. 
Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home, what is home? That is a property, is that right? No one has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields, another property, for me and for the gospel will fail to receive the hundredfold or a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, which is property, brothers and sisters, mothers, children and fields, which is land, along with some persecution. And in the age to come eternal life. Jesus is saying, if you are willing to abandon what you think you own, you'll receive in this life 10,000% increase. 100 fold is 10,000%. In the life to come, you'll get eternal life. Yes, we want that, definitely. But we want more than eternal life. We want abundant life. Eternal life is one day in heaven. Abundant life is right now on earth. And Jesus says, if, if you're willing to make the shift from ownership to stewardship, you will receive a 10,000% return on investment. If you can think of that house as not yours but God's, God says, I can increase it by 10,000% the value of that. If you think of your property portfolio as not yours but God's, he can, if you think of your business as not yours but God's, He can increase it by 10,000%. I think of Mr. Colgate, and I share the story on tomorrow's sermon, where he, he was on his way to, to, I think it was Chicago or New York, and on the, on the boat, when he traveled there, a preacher led him to Jesus, and, and he, said to him, he said to him, what must I do sir, with my life? And, and the preacher asked him, he said, what can you do? He says, no, I'm, I'm, my trade, my family trade is making soap. And I want to start, I've got a job here at a soap factory. He says, well, what you do is, from the first dollar that you earn, son, give 10% to the church. And continue to do that for the rest of your life, and God will bless you. And true, what Mr. Colgate, William Colgate, did, when he earned his first dollar, he gave 10 cents to the Lord. Continue to do that. And by the time Mr. Colgate, which later owned the company and started the Colgate company that we know today. At the end of his, of his working life, Mr. Colgate donated 90% of his income to churches and charities and kingdom advancing initiatives. And he only lived on 10%. Because he realized his 10% is much more than what 100% would have been if it was his business. You see, because he said, it's not mine. I moved from owning this to becoming a steward. And Jesus says, if you can make the shift from ownership to stewardship, 10,000% increase is your portion. Isn't that amazing? Not in eternal life. Yes, you get that tick. But you get it in this life. 10,000%. Who's in for 10,000%? God showed me, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I recorded it in the book, how on property... You can actually get a 10,000% return on investment. And just read the book. I don't have time to go through it now, but read the book. Really, it's in there. It's amazing. It's phenomenal. I love the way the kingdom economy works. Are you ready for the final principle on, on kingdom wealth? It's the principle of multiplication. And I don't have to say too much about it because we did cover it last night. But you have the power to multiply but Jesus multiplies. He multiplies the bread two times to feed thousands of people with five loaves and two fish. And the other time with four loaves. And so in this story in Matthew 14, we learn some things, the principles of multiplication. First of all, we need to take stock. Jesus said to them, count how much you have before the time and count how much you have afterwards. Why do we need to take stock of what we have? Be good stewards. Because we want to measure the miracle. You see, if we didn't count the bread before and after time, how would we know? If we didn't count how many people we fed, how would we know the size of the miracle that God is doing? Okay? The law of multiplication. A word from God is our mandate to multiply. Jesus said to the disciples, you feed them. And the moment he said, you feed them, he knew they only had five loaves and two fish. The moment God gives you a word, don't... Let your resources master you, but let the Word of God master you. Don't submit to the resources, but come under the sound of His Word, because His Word spoken to you is your mandate to multiply what you have. Remember what is the double Word of God. It, it holds within itself all the resources to fulfill itself. It's like a heat-seeking missile. 
The moment God speaks a word, everything is released in that word to make you succeed, to make you multiply what you have. Submit your limited resources to His unlimited presence. The moment they put the loaves in the hands of Jesus, they submitted their little five loaves and their two fish to the unlimited presence of the Master. And then finally, allow the miracle to happen in your hands. I found this every time when God does a miracle. The miracle does not happen in His hands. After I submit whatever I have, my limited resources to Him, He gives it back. He says, you make the flat. You write the book. You do this. You do that. The miracle will always happen in your hands because God is into partnership. Isn't that amazing? The law of multiplication. Are you ready to own this? Remember to register for this series, order the handbook and join a small group by contacting info at cohcc.net or 79 520 Help us spread this message by sharing it on Facebook or by making a financial donation with the reference Wealth.